So, who's been to Notre Dame? Yeah, okay, that, that, that could explain why you're here. Thank, thank you for your patience. So this is a really recent picture, by the way, the, the, the previous one there. So the new spire, the wooden structure of the new spire is behind that scaffolding. You can't see any of it because it won't be, the scaffolding won't be removed until the lead covering is put on, which will start this year, as Michel Picot will explain. So we're gonna divide this lecture into two parts, Notre Dame then and now. I do the then part, which is the first 860 years. Uh, on the left, to, to, and then Michel will pick it up on April 19th, 2019. And I'm, 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 I'm going to tell you a lot about Notre Dame. I'm going to tell it quickly, too, because there's so, so much to tell. And why, you know, we all love Notre Dame, but why? What is it that makes it unique? And it's really unique. It's 860 years old, literally. The first stone was laid 860 years ago. And it took 182 years to build. This is one of the oldest cathedrals in France. It's the second oldest cathedral in France, to be precise. The first one was built 10 miles north of Paris uh, in the town of Saint-Denis, just 20 years before Notre Dame, 30 years before Notre Dame laid its first stone. And it's done in the early Gothic style. And the Gothic style replaced the Romanesque style of architecture, which was around basically between the 1000 and 1200 AD. And you can see what a dramatic change it was from this very simple, very solid, very stolid, very dark and low uh, structure. The Romanesque style means it's descended from the Romans. Thick walls, small windows, rounded arches, barrel vaults, exterior buttresses, simple decoration from the 10th to the 12th century. And I'll talk, talk about all of that stuff. And it was replaced by the Gothic style, which was developed in France. And the name Gothic, when you hear Gothic, you think of the Goths, the German Germanic tribe. Well, not at all. It is actually the Gothic style of architecture was developed in France. Uh, uh, and the name was, was used by the Rota Italians who had come up with their extremely sophisticated, beautiful Renaissance. Uh, design, and they disparage the, the old-fashioned, clunky French style as Gothic. Barbaric was the implication, but it caught on, and so now we all say Gothic in, in a complimentary fashion. So, I love this quote, the history of architecture is the history of the struggle for light, and no more so than in the Gothic style of architecture. It's all about light and height to create these magnificent cathedrals that were unheard of in terms of their size, their magnificence uh, during the Middle Ages. And they did it through these four methods, and I'm gonna talk about each of them. Pointed arches, rib vaults, flying buttresses, rose windows. And this gives you an idea of what all of those are. Flying buttresses on the left, you know, they stretch, stretch out. Uh, hit a buttress or a pier, go down. The arc brise, instead of being rounded, they, there's a point at the top of the arch. These are things that are uh, in a, uh, a groin vault. I'll be talking about the rib vault, which is one of the key factors in the Gothic style. And the Gothic style, it lasted a good long time. What did I say? It was 330 years or something like that. And it was hardly stagnant. It went through phases. It went through the early Gothic, sometimes called primitive Gothic, high Gothic, sometimes called classic, the radiant Gothic, and the, the late Gothic, sometimes called flamboyant Gothic. And each one of those had their own evolutions in the architectural style. So how did they get from Romanesque to Gothic? Well, I'll go through each of these. Rounded archers and barrel vaults became pointed arches and ribbed vaults. What does all that mean? So this is a barrel vault. It's rounded. It's completely it distributes the weight, this very heavy weight of this rounded barrel vault onto the walls next to them. The same amount of weight is displaced on each one of the each inch of the walls, and as a result, the walls had to be incredibly solid, and they couldn't have big windows in them, or you impair the in structural integrity. 
and they had to be enforced by buttresses that were just stuck up against the side of the church to keep the wall, because the pressure was going down and out, so you needed to press the walls in to keep, keep them up. Rib vault, on the other hand, brilliant innovation of Gothic, Gothic architecture. Rib vault, you've got these ribs that are on the, uh, the arches and also across the vault, and they bear all of the weight, all of the weight. These narrow ribs that go, there are four of them in this picture, that go down to the columns bear all of the weight. And the panels, the space in between the ribs, bears no weight. Brilliant innovation, or, or they bear the weight of the uh, panels, nothing more. Exterior buttresses changed to flying buttresses. So this is an exterior buttress, just literally reinforcing a wall. This is the Église Saint-Julien-le-Pauvre in Paris, arguably the oldest Paris church, Romanesque style. And it changed to the flying buttress, where you had these gigantic flyers, as they call them, reaching out from the wall, supporting the wall at the, at the top, not at the bottom, at the top. The bottom was actually supported by these side aisles, those, those serve the purpose of buttresses, the side aisles. And there, this shows this is an interesting diagram because it shows you the walls and the flying buttresses transfer the thrust down and out. And that's why all of these cathedrals, they're not skinny cathedrals like that. They go down like this because you need to have the side aisles to support the main nave. And then to support the walls on top of the side aisles, you need to have the flying buttresses pushing the walls in to counterbalance the weight from the roof that's coming down and out. So a picture of the arches, sometimes known flyers, leading from the wall to the piers, sometimes known as buttresses or uprights. And then on top of the buttresses, you've got these little pinnacles, sometimes that look like little buildings, and they're there purely for weight. They're decorative, true, but in, in order to more push more down, uh, again, give more power to the uh, buttress, they put the pinnacles on top. This is a very early Gothic flying buttress from the Église Saint-Germain-des-Prés, and you can see it's very much simpler than the buttresses, the flying buttresses at Notre Dame. Much more elaborate. These are high Gothic. The first ones were early Gothic topped by pinnacles around the chevet, which is the eastern end of the church. So another thing that changed uh, in the Gothic style, the very early Gothic had elevations of four levels and the vaults had six parts, six ribs. High Gothic reduced it, interestingly, three levels and quadripartite, four-part four rib vaults. Those changes allowed the architects, well, they weren't architects, they were builders back then, uh, to create even higher cathedrals and bigger windows and more harmonious uh, infrastructure. This gives you an idea of what a four-story elevation looked like, the first ones. And you can see there, there the bottom, you've got the aisles, the side aisles, ambulatoire, ambulatories they're sometimes called, Above them, you've got the tribune or gallery. Above them, the triforium, which is kind of hidden, actually. You can't really see it. And then above that, the clear story, uh, which is the highest level, which is where the windows typically were. And that, uh, that broke it up a lot. Therefore, and okay, so there's a photo uh, that shows you the same cathedral, actually, those same four levels, as they call the elevation there. And one of the improvements was to reduce the four levels to a three-level elevation. They eliminated the tribune or arcade over the side aisle, allowing the clear story windows at the very top to be that much bigger, letting in that much more light, which is what Le Corbusier was talking all about. So here you get the, okay, a three-story elevation enables larger windows. The Basilica of Saint-Denis, the first Gothic cathedral which was redone. A lot of these 
they're, they're very old cathedrals. I mean, they, they redo them. They don't just leave them necessarily uh, as they were first built. Um, so quadripartite vo vaults. Th this is a sextipartite vault. These are the original vaults that they used for the ceilings of the Gothic cathedrals, and they're beautiful. They're very complex. If you count them, one, two, three, four, you, you got three uh, ribs on one side, three ribs on the other side uh, to make a sexpartite vault. And as a result of that, uh, they actually go over to what they call bays. These arches are called bays. So in order to execute this structure, they have two bays. One uh, has a strong pillar on the outside and a, and a weak pillar on the inside. The, to make it simple, it an, creates an unequal distribution of weight and it makes it more difficult to make, big, to make a big, strong, high cathedral. Therefore, they switched to the simpler uh, quadripartite vault which allowed equal distribution of weight and allowed them to build even higher walls. So there you have an example of a sexpartite vault that had to be spread over two bays to create a square compartment. And you can see the top two arrows point to strong pillars uh, and the bottom arrow points to a weak pillar. It's, it, it's great looking, but it structurally is just less solid than equal weight distribution where you have all the pillars the same size and equal distribution of weight. Four part vaults, very simple, particularly on, a, uh, on the side aisles are almost all four uh, part rib vaults because they're so narrow you can easily create a square compartment over one bay. Uh, and they do the same thing. Uh, in the nave as well. This is the Église Saint-Séverin, which is just across the river from Notre Dame. And one, two, three, four uh, compartments in the, the quadripartite rib vault over the nave there. But they are not, no longer square compartments, they're oblong compartments, but that's okay. They still manage to distribute the weight equally. Simple decoration from Romanesque to Gothic, the very, very simple decoration decoration uh, moves to much more elaborate uh, decoration. And here you see the western facade of the Saint Église Saint-Lazare uh, d'Autant, uh, which is very simple, no decoration, no statuary to speak of at all. There is something above the tympanum. Uh, uh, there's a tympanum above the central door, but look at Notre Dame. It's, it's much more elaborate, but it ain't flamboyant. And I'll show you a flamboyant facade later, which it took it to another level. This is simple high Gothic. It went to rayonnant Gothic and flamboyant Gothic. And it got really, if you want to go to, uh, we'll show pictures. So decoration, well in the old days, mosaics were how uh, churches were de decorated in the center. And they're, they're magnificent, no doubt about it. But you need light really to set them off to good, the best advantage, uh, but they were replaced in the Gothic era by stained glass windows. And there's no better place to go to see stained glass windows, and which of course have the advantage of letting in some light, unlike the mosaics. But that's why they were there, is because they didn't, you were covering all these wall, this wall space. Uh, the best place to see mosaics is Chartres, where they're still 152 of the original medieval stained glass windows, which is unique. That's just one of them. Gothic churches in Paris. Well, there are quite a few Gothic churches in Paris, but we, of course, will be talking about Notre Dame. And that has elements of the early Gothic, high Gothic, and rayonnant Gothic. Notre Dame. 182 years to build, huge cathedral, biggest of its era, bigger than Saint-Denis. It replaced the Église Saint-Étienne, St. Stephen's uh, Basilica that had been there for 500 years before, located at the eastern end of the Ile de la Cité, which was the first island really inhabited, first by the Parisi tribe of uh, Celts, then by the then the Romans came and they occupied the left bank at the bottom of your screen because it was high and dry and the right bank was a marsh, marais. 
in front of Notre Dame, just Notre Dame is the center of Paris. It was and still always will be the center of Paris. And to mark that, uh, this emblem was put in the, embedded in the parvis in front of Notre Dame back in 1900 years ago, actually. Point zero des routes de, de, de France, because whenever you're going to Paris, this is what they measure to. This is the epicenter of Paris, where some people have said it's the epicenter of France, it's the epicenter of civilization. <laughs> so Maurice de Sully, Bishop of Paris, laid the first stone in 1163. And I'm going to quickly go through how he built it. So the first, and this is the, the scenario. So all Gothic churches are in this shape. They're a Latin cross with a nave, a choir at the right, and a transept across the center. Typically, uh, in the second phase of Gothic, they have four-part vaults up and down the nave and the choir, and up and down the ambulatory, also known as aisles. You can see those crosses, the X's, those are four-part vaults. And they all point east. And there's a, a Latin phrase, ad orientum. The chevet and the altar always pointed east in the Middle Ages, and that was the case until the 16th century. If you go to any church in Europe, any church built before 1550 is going to point east. After that, the rules changed. Why do they point east? Because that's where the sun comes up. That is light. That is where Jesus was resurrected. So in the earliest days when the Christians were praying, they did it at dawn outside, and they saw the sun rise. There was no building. But they respected that tradition up until 1550. And obviously the opposite is that the west facade is the, the, where the entrance is, and, and that represents where the sun sets, or darkness, or death. And as a result, you have uh, on the west facade, usually the center portal is decorated with uh, sculptures representing the last judgment. So plan of Notre Dame pretty much what I described earlier, except it's got a double ambulatory. It's got two aisles uh, on either side of the nave, and it's got a sexpartite vault over the nave and the choir. And when they built, as I said, they all point east, all these cathedrals point east, and they were built from east to west. So first they, they start literally at the easternmost part, and they work their way west. And that actually, they kind of, they built a, f a temporary wall there, and they, that is the choir. That's the part where the clergy could go. The commoners couldn't go there. Uh, the, the congregants couldn't go there. So they actually built a wall there because it's now 1177, so they've been building for 12 years, 15 years, and now it's time for them to actually start conducting services uh, in that part. But they kept building the rest. And the first shot they, uh, was built in the early Gothic style with a four-story elevation. And you can see how small the windows are at the top. So this is a, a church that's extant that was built at the same time. And it's still pretty heavy. Certainly the uh, flying buttresses are quite simple. So during the construction of Notre Dame, things had evolved. Uh, and people came up with this new improved idea of having a three-story elevation. And so they said, okay, they rebuilt it. They actually st took down, eliminated one of the levels and created a three-story elevation, which re resulted in new and bigger windows in the clerestory. And that is what it looks like today. Well, under the scaffolding. And this is a great photo because it shows you on the right the old system with, with four stories where they had this little window on top and a much smaller oculus, as it's called, that was actually covered by a pitched 
roof on the outside, so it didn't let in any light. Uh, on the right and on the left, you've got the new upper level windows composed of two lancets and a rose window at the very top. So they raised the roof of Notre Dame. After you know, They didn't just stop, they kept on modifying it uh, with a six part vault. And uh, they have equal, all the pillars are the same. There's no weak and strong pillar. The double ambulatories uh, uh, on either side of the nave have each of them quadripartite vaults. And the transept has a quadripartite vault in the center and a sexpartite on either side and then another quadripartite. And that, by the way, is where the spire came crashing through, is number four. In the, literally the center, because the spire was directly over the center of the transept. And that's, and as Michel will explain, there were three holes poked in the vaults. So on the left, you see the new clear story with the higher roof and the flat, uh, sorry, and the, the flat roof by the triforium with the bigger windows on the right, they haven't done that yet. So you can see the four-story elevation and how, uh, how much brighter uh, the left is than the right. Again, the, how much bigger the windows, the new windows were, letting in light thanks to the extra height. And these high, thin walls were supported by 28 flying buttresses. different types of flying buttress. These are 50 feet long. That's, it's, it's unheard of and very aesthetically pleasing. You know, it's not clunky like the ones at Saint-Germain. And pinnacles were added on top uh, to give weight to the buttresses. Then they actually reached the west facade, built it. This wonderful uh, recreation, uh, computerized recreation, shows that actually the stat statuary, everything that's colored are statues. So they actually painted the statues that are on, on the doors, uh, uh, on either side of the doors, the Gallery of Kings. It was painted, as were all Gothic churches up until I don't know what exact stage. Then they stopped painting them and then when the, w the paint wore off they didn't replace it. And the new ones didn't, weren't painted. This shows just how small the square was in front of Notre Dame originally. It was jammed. The Ile de la Cité was absolutely jammed. Medieval street. The, o uh, the only straight street was the one directly in front of Notre Dame which is called the Rue Neuve Notre Dame. The new road of Notre Dame uh, built to have access to the cathedral uh, and bring building materials. The west facade will quickly go through what it looks like. So the bottom level, you got three portals, which is fairly typical. What's interesting is that they were each built at different times and different styles. If you look at them even from here, you can tell none of them looks, uh, I, none of them is identical or similar to the other. And originally the statues, as I said, were all painted. This is the center portal, and of course it is of the Last Judgment because it's facing west. And it shows this amazing, I love this sculpture. This is the best one, the weighing of the souls. If you don't get weighed right, you go off to the right and it's interesting to follow that chain. It's not pretty what happens to you. <laughs> and on the, uh, the left portal, the north, next to the north tower, is the portal to the Virgin. It is, after all, Notre Dame, Our Lady with this famous statue of Saint-Denis holding his head. Uh, he was decapitated by the Romans in 275 AD, something like that. He was the first bishop of Paris, and legend has it that he carried his he head 10 miles north. He was, he was beheaded at Montmartre, Mountain of Martyrs, and walked six miles to the northeast and, and dr collapsed at Saint-Denis, and that's where they built the cathedral, n'est-ce pas? Okay, I've got several French friends here who can correct me, so. And I love this board. This is the, the portal on the right. And why is this neat? It's because you can see that the, that the uh, sculpture in the 
tympanum above there is kind of rounded. It doesn't fill the pointed space completely. And it turns out that it's because it came from the previous cathedral. It was removed from Saint Etienne's cathedral. It, it, it wasn't that old, it had been built in 1150, but they literally transferred it from the old cathedral to the new cathedral. And you can see how much cruder the sculpture is compared to the other two. And there's a, an idea of what it must have looked like when it was in the previous cathedral, no doubt, uh, in the center. Gallery of Kings, 28 Kings of Judah, and that will come back to us. Originally painted. Above that, the balcony of the Virgin with the great rose window, another key feature of Gothic architecture, the use of rose windows, not only stained glass, but rose windows. And Notre Dame. And the Grand Gallery on top. And then the towers. They were originally going to have spires on them, so they might have looked something like this. But they never got around to building the spires. So we have these. And in the right, uh, the south, since it's always facing east, we know the one on the right is the south top tower. Uh, it houses the two great bells known as the Grand et Petit Bourdon. And these have names. The bells have names uh, in France. So this is Emmanuel. Emmanuel's a heavyweight. And the Petit Bourdon was replaced uh, for the 850th uh, anniversary of the laying of the first stone of Notre Dame with this new Petit Bourdon named Marie, a mere six tons. And in the North Tower, that's, there are eight smaller bells. And all of those bells were replaced. Uh, whoops. Huh, okay, forget it. Um, all of those bells were replaced in 2013, which I will mention later. So here I mentioned that you know, the high Gothic style is a heck, heck of a lot more elaborate than the Romanesque uh, west facade, but it's a heck of a lot simpler than the Rayonnant Gothic uh, facade of the Cathedral of Reims. Nave chapels. So after they built the, the piling, the piers supporting the flying buttresses, then they filled in the space between the piers with chapels, building them from the west to the east between the piers. And having done that, then they extended the sides, the ends of the two transepts a little bit further so that they weren't flush with the chapels the, uh, the, that had just been built. And the north transept was built, the new facade was built uh, first. Uh, and it has the spectacular rose window in the Rayonon Gothic style with radiating spokes. It's the only rose window in Notre Dame with the original glass. It's not, Chartres has had, what it was, 151 windows with the original glass. Notre Dame only has one. And there's a little red door. And you wonder if you, if you go there, you see this little red door on the side next to the transept entrance. And you wonder what it's for. Well, it turns out that it was for the, the, the clergy to enter directly into the choir part of the cathedral. They didn't have to go around to the front like everybody else. And then the south transept facade was similarly redone, as was the south rose window in the Rayonon Gothic style. But that window was rebuilt in the 18th century. And the west rose window, the one above the, the, the three portals we looked at a while back, was the earliest one built. Uh, it's the smallest, it's the oldest, uh, and it's in a different so-called wheel style. But when they started in installing organs, pipe organs, so there, there weren't organs in 1163 when they started building Notre Dame, but they developed over the years, and then they had to put them somewhere. And so ultimately in the 18th century, they started installing uh, gigantic pipe organs 
in these great cathedrals. And more often than not, they decided to put the organ right at the uh, back of the church or the, yeah, the front, back of the church. Uh, so that's why you can often not see the rose windows. So moving ahead, Notre Dame dominated, as you can uh, imagine, the skyline of Paris, visible from miles away. At 226 feet, the, to the towers of Notre Dame were the highest structures in Paris. And that gives you a pretty good idea of just how impressive, how awe-inspiring the cathedral, not just Notre Dame, but really medieval cathedrals were in every town. They towered over everything. There might have been a four, five, even six-story house next to it, but nothing equals the magnificence and the, the scale of Notre Dame. And it only became, it was surpassed in height by the construction of the wonderful dome church uh, by Louis XIV in the late 17th century. The grand organ that is at Notre Dame today and will be again shortly uh, was only installed in the earlier part of the 18th century. It's the largest pipe organ in France with 8,000 pipes. The original spire uh, that uh, was not as tall as the current one uh, was removed at the time of the revolution just because a lot of the, it was mainly you know, wood, wood covered by uh, lead. And it, after all these years, you know, 500 years of climate you know, being buffeted in the wind, it was in a dilapidated, st dilapidated state and had to be removed. Then there are the Les May. Les May. It turns out that there are all sorts of spectacular large format paintings. Uh, there were 73 that were given uh, by the Corporation des Orfèvres, the Goldsmiths Guild. Uh, every May, they contributed a different huge painting. Here's the one from 1634, 1635, 1637. And they were all hung along the walls of the nave. Viollet le Duc mo moved them. Do I say this? Moved them uh, a, a lot uh, to other churches, and he installed—I forget exactly how many of them, thirty something like that—in uh, the chapels that are along the side aisles, no longer in the nave. A lot of restoration work went on in the, in the 19th, 18th century. Choir redecorated, rude screen, which is the screen that separated the choir from the nave. Uh, and it was there to separate the congregants from the clergy. And back in the old days, the clergy was facing east. The altar was facing east. They were speaking Latin. There was a wall behind them called a rood screen. Behind the wall were the congregants. They couldn't see what was going on. They couldn't hear what was going on. It was not a user-friendly experience. Uh, and so when the uh, Council of Trent got together and they were trying to figure out what can we do to counter the Reformation, bring them back and all, they came up with a few clever ideas. One of them was to get rid of the rude screen so you can actually see what's going on on the other side there. The other one was to turn the altar around and put it near the transept and face the congregation instead of having your back to the congregation. And then they also started to do, I think, some uh, uh, services in the vernacular in French. So the walls were whitewashed back then. And uh, 12 of the original 13th century stained glass windows were replaced with clear, not clear, but white glass to let in more light because they, they figured it needed more light. Then the revolution, that changed everything. All churches were closed in the first two years of the revolution. The revolutionary government was atheistic. They did not believe in religion, uh, uh, certainly Christian religion. So they confiscated, they closed all the churches, all the monasteries, and they confiscated all the churches, all the property of the churches.
And many churches were, were repurposed. They were used sometimes to store things, whatever. Notre Dame became a temple of reason because the cult of reason replaced the Roman Catholicism as the religion of France. During the revolution, uh, the revolutionary government said you should destroy, take down all royal symbols, remove all royal symbols from Paris. And so the revolutionary the, uh, people went out and they hauled down all 28 kings from the gallery of kings and decapitated them, literally, thinking that these were French kings. And they're not French kings. They're the kings of Judah, but nevertheless, they were decapitated. And after the revolution was over, uh, the church was restored to the, the French cult, as, uh, the Catholic cult, uh, but the ownership was not. And it remains ever since then owned by the state. This physical cathedral is owned by the state of France, the Republic of France. All cathedrals in France are owned by the French Republic, local churches, uh, Non-cathedrals are owned by the localities, not by the, the Catholic Church, although that may be different for churches built after 1905 when the law that I'm referring to was passed. So Napoleon, when he proclaimed himself emperor in 1804, he went to Notre Dame because that was the place to go. It was a wreck, however. Therefore, he had to put tapestries on the inside to cover up the, uh, warm it. He had to build make it put in rugs and all because it was a wreck. This is a wonderful picture by David of, of Napoleon crowning himself emperor while Pope, the Pope looks on, not best pleased. So after Napoleon, after the restoration, we have the monarchy, the constitutional monarchy, the July monarchy of Louis Philippe. And he created the Commission of Historic Monuments. Uh, and uh, the, one of the main inspectors, Prosper Mary May, uh, created the first list of historic monuments, but none were in France, in Paris, none. So it, it fell to the people uh, to make the case for, for restoring and preserving Notre Dame. Famously, uh, the book by Victor Hugo in French, it's the Notre Dame de Paris, and in English, it's the Hunchback of Notre Dame, Notre Dame, drew attention to the cathedral's plight, and it was listened to uh, by Louis Philippe, and they undertook the restoration of Notre Dame uh, in this 17-year period with two uh, architects, Jean-Baptiste Lassus, who died, and uh, the work was carried on by Eugène Viollet-le-Duc, who's generally considered to be the first restoration architect, and he had to kind of make it up. You know, no one had done restoration work, so they weren't clear on how, the, how do you restore a cathedral. So what did they start with? There were no kings in the gallery. They'd all been removed and decapitated. There were no statues beside the portals. He restored all of that. So actually, the, all of the statuary that you see in Notre Dame today, and the west facade was not touched by the fire. So you go there and it looks just like it did before the fire. And all of this you see there today was work done by Viollet le Duc, although it was cleaned uh, in the 1990s. There were no spire that had been removed before the revolution, no pinnacles on the piers of the flying buttresses. So Viollet le Duc installed pinnacles on the piers alongside the nave and the choir. He built a new higher spire. He did not recreate the original spire. He said that's unworthy of the cathedral. We need to have something that is worthy of this magnificent cathedral. So he ins took inspiration from the last Gothic spire built in France in Amiens. So that he copied that essentially, used that as his inspiration for building the spire that uh, went up in flames five years ago. And it's surrounded by 16 copper statues at the base, which are the 12 apostles plus the four evangelists and St. Thomas, patron saint of the architects, with the face of Viollet le Duc, Louis Mem. <laughs> he restored the transept corner windows with the oculus, so we now can see how it used to be when it was a four elevation uh, 
facade or elevate four story elevation, which is very cool. All the gargoyles, 603 gargoyles, which are built in order to move the water, the rainwater goes down the pier, the flying buttress out to the end, and you want the water to flow, uh, fall as far from the foundations as possible to, to maintain their integrity. Uh, but all of them had been around for 700 years and they were in terrible shape. Uh, therefore, they were all replaced. And he added, because you know, he thought this, this, this cathedral needs a little more. Uh, so he came up with the idea of a, a chimere, these wonderful, grotesque, demonic figures, the, the most important of which is the fam most famous of which is the strig. So after no, uh, restoration with a new spire, new statues, new pinnacles, new chimneys, new gargoyles, plus chimere, Finally, it was added to the list of historic monuments. <laughs> Baron Osman had he, the project. He, he didn't have much to do with Notre Dame proper, but what he did was to create the square in front of Notre Dame. This is what the Ile de la Cité looked like before Osman. This is what it looked like after Osman. Literally, everything between Notre Dame and the Conciergerie at the west end of the island was flattened and replaced with three gigantic buildings. In addition to the three gigantic buildings, the arrow is pointing on the top there, that's the Hotel Dieu. The square one in the middle is the Prefecture de Police, and uh, above it on the left is the Tribunal de Commerce. And the arrow is pointing to the Parvis, the square in Notre Dame, which is four times larger than the square that had been there before. Fast forward 100 years. The liberation of Paris. De Gaulle walks down the Champs-Élysées from the Arc de Triomphe to Notre Dame days after Paris was liberated to attend a special mass. Fast forward another 15 years. Notre Dame was black. We forget, but it wasn't that long ago that they started cleaning cathedrals. And there was a road in front of the entrance there at the time. This is back in the 60s. And they dug like they did in the 60s. They dug a giant underground pit there for an underground parking lot. And they ran into some Gallo-Roman ruins, which was very inconvenient. Uh, uh, but uh, you can go down to the crypt, archaeological crypt. And Andre Malraux had the bright idea to clean the monuments of Paris, starting with Notre Dame. And you can see how white it is today. And believe me, it's going to be equally white once, once it reopens. The interior is going to be blinding. The Galerie des Wa with the kings, uh, remember the heads? Well, those heads were found, believe it or not, 20 of them, uh, in, next door to where Michel Picot was working at the time. Uh, he was out digging, and, <laughs> and, and he ran across a few heads and uh, gave them to the Musée de Cluny of the Middle Ages where you can see them. And you can see how incredibly, they're in bad shape. They were big. Renovation works, they, okay, I'm not gonna go through all of this. They cleaned the Western facade, just the Western facade and the two towers in the 1990s, which is why they look so great now. They didn't do anything behind it, which is why they look in such terrible shape. And that's why, oh, in 2013, the 850th anniversary, nine new bells, including Marie here and the eight smaller bells behind. The old ones used to be on display behind. And a major restoration campaign was begun partially funded by the Friends of Notre Dame, created by uh, Michel Picot, ici présent, in 2017, that's correct? Yeah. yeah. Uh, scaffolding was constructed because they were gonna start the restoration by restoring the spire. And the 16 statues that were put up by Viollet le Duc were removed in order to be restored. And then this happened. And I turn it over to Michel Picot.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Russell. Uh, hello, everybody. Very nice to meet with you uh, this evening. Thank you for the invitation of the Norton Museum. Uh, so I start, uh, so I will cover only the five uh, last years, and I will cover the, uh, the fire of April 15, 2019. This, uh, <coughs> actually, this fire uh, happened, I would say, at uh, 6, 6.30 in the evening in Paris, and it happened at the, uh, at the bottom of, of the spire of the cathedral. As you can see here, we had the scaffolding, which was the scaffolding of the first phase of the restoration we had undertaken before the fire. Uh, and uh, and unfortunately, we had a very strong uh, east wind, which pushed actually the fire also under the roof. And uh, is the spire that you see here, just in the beginning of beginning of the night. So we we had this terrible uh, uh, happening of fighting uh, against the fire. So there were very uh, bad conditions because. The, uh, there were some mistakes uh, made. First of all, the, uh, the guy in charge of the security uh, wrongly uh, detected the, uh, the alarm, and he believed that the, the fire was uh, in, under the roof of the sacristy of the cathedral. So we lost probably 20 minutes uh, in the beginning. Uh, secondly, the... Uh, I would say there was no uh, firefighting uh, team, no firefighters on site, so they had to come in the heavy traffic of Paris at the end of the day. Uh, and so in the end, so there was not enough water, uh, so we had to, uh, to bring uh, ships to pump water from the Seine River. And so the, uh, the fire, <coughs> so I was there actually with uh, my wife Cecile, uh, on the square in front of the cathedral that night, and the fire progressed under the roof of the cathedral, and unfortunately, it began to uh, to start also in the north tower of the cathedral, where we have uh, a belfry, a wooden belfry, which supports the bells that you have been uh, informed about. And so this was really the tipping uh, moment of this night when the firefighters succeeded stopping the fire in the belfry of, of the North Tower, uh, climbing up very narrow uh, staircase and so on. And so around midnight, I would say, we, we fortunately, we uh, realized that they, they were succeeding and they continued in the rest of the night and uh, in the morning. So. We, we were uh, safe. So you know perhaps that this also raised a very, a very strong uh, wave of, let's say, emotion, and there were people on the banks of the Seine singing. Uh, and uh, at the end of the night, so we, we had this, uh, this scenery of uh, like after a bombing, because effectively in the center of the, the cathedral at Sunset Crossing, there was these big holes in the middle where the spire had collapsed. There, were, there was also another uh, hole in the vaults of the nave because when the spire collapsed, it, uh, it touched the, the vaults of the nave. And there was also another uh, big uh, hole in the north transept because of the timbers which had fallen. Uh, and so you see here the, uh, the, these charred timbers in the middle of the cathedral, with also all the structure of the cathedral very much weakened, uh, first of all by the fire, and, and afterwards also by the watering, which was undertaken by the firefighters. So this is another view, a few, a few days uh, after. So you see this big uh, hole. This, you see also these uh, black uh, timbers uh, burnt on the vaults, and you see also the the gable of the north transept on the left-hand side of this picture, which began also to, to tilt because the roof was not anymore there. So the balance of the overall building uh, was uh, at risk. And fortunately, unfortunately, we, we had still this, this burnt scaffolding in the middle, which in a way helped sustain the, the walls of the cathedral because 
uh, hadn't been there, so I think the walls would have collapsed as well. So we entered what we call the, uh, the safety phase of the cathedral, uh, more or less the first two years after the fire, so uh, 2019, 2020, beginning of 2021. And we progressively uh, removed this uh, uh, burnt scaffolding uh, very uh, cautiously, uh, as I said. And uh, this was one of the first things uh, that we undertook. Sorry. And, uh, and so this is a, this is a view of, of the building, <coughs> I would say, in the course of the restoration. And you see that the overall structure below the roof, and evidently without spire, was relatively uh, preserved. So I think this is interesting to, to see that. Even though, even though uh, if we get back a little bit, all the flying buttresses that you see here were at risk. And so we installed very big uh, wooden brackets below the flying buttresses, below the 28 large flying buttresses to protect them for the restoration itself. Here you have a view of the uh, architect uh, in chief of uh, historical monuments, Philippe Villeneuve, working on the project. Effectively, the building <coughs> to, um, to also uh, rebound on what uh, Russell said, so the building is the property of the state and the church is the uh, kind of uh, permanent tenant of the cathedral. Here you have another view of uh, what we, we did. We had to remove all these uh, charred timbers and we installed also uh, what we call an umbrella, which was a, a wooden floor and, and also a tarp on top of it to protect most of the cathedral from the weather, from the rain or potentially the snow from time to time. And so we did it in order to allow uh, these uh, craftspeople that you see here that we called the squirrels or the, because they were like a little bit like squirrels and they, and they cleaned, uh, they cleaned the, uh, the vaults uh, hanging on ropes uh, because they, the vaults were very much weakened and there was still a risk of some stones falling or even uh, more dangerous things. So they cleaned everything. And afterwards, what we did, we installed very large brackets under the vaults of the cathedral. So we, we raised up very big scaffoldings inside the cathedral. We installed wooden floors under the vaults in order to begin the uh, restoration of the vaults of the cathedral that you can see here, which is part of the choir of the cathedral. What we did also at uh, Transept Crossing, at, uh, Transept Crossing, yes, we had to prepare the rebuilding so, uh, but the, um, the scaffolding that you have seen previously is a very heavy scaffolding to, to build the spire. So it was supposed to be something like 600 ton scaffolding. So we had to prepare the ground to effectively install this scaffolding. And so we, we made some, uh, uh, I would say, excavations and we discovered a very interesting uh, uh, remainders uh, under the floor of the cathedral. And you can see uh, here, for instance, uh, a sarcophagus that we discovered, the sar sarcophagus of one of the canons of the cathedral in the Middle Ages. And we discovered also uh, fragments of the root screen of the Middle Ages, and with also colored parts of this root screen. And so this will be restored and this will be not reinstalled because we will not reinstall the root screen <laughs> because we, we now we have understood that <laughs> people needed to see a little bit what, what takes place at the bottom of the cathedral. But this will be put in a new museum uh, which of Notre Dame, which will be, uh, I would say, um, created after the restoration of the cathedral with these uh, pieces of uh, art that we uh, found. An example of the scaffoldings inside the cathedral. So the cathedral was completely, I would say, filled by scaffoldings to do all the restoration works, uh, both on the vaults, but also on the walls. And you will see also the chapels a little bit later. 
So this is uh, one of the famous uh, statues of the spire, which were effectively uh, and fortunately removed four days before the fire. And uh, this is a statue of, so th you see the statues before restoration. And this one uh, just uh, up front is a statue after restoration. We, we have put, I would say, these statues in the state they were in when Viollet-le-Duc in the 19th century uh, put this statue on the spire. So uh, this one is uh, the statue of Saint Thomas. So this is the one with the face of Viollet-le-Duc. And it's the only one looking up to the, the, the peak of the spire because uh, the other ones are looking down to Paris. But Viollet-le-Duc, he wanted to show that he was admiring uh, what he had done. And so, uh, and so this very modest guy. <laughs> and, uh, but typical of the French people. Uh, and so this is what he, he realized. So this is a view of the uh, uh, West Rose Window. So one of the most beautiful one, one of the three large rose window with the uh, Virgin Mary in the middle. Um, and so we, we took advantage of this, uh, let's say, restoration to clean up all these uh, rose windows, which were uh, preserved in the fire. So. They, they were not damaged, so they, they needed to be restored, so we took advantage of it to do it. This is um, a detail of this uh, west rose window. This is the, uh, for, for those of you who are familiar with the Bible, this is the story of uh, Joseph, and perhaps you, perhaps you know that Joseph, actually, he was pushed back by his brothers to Egypt, and he had a lot of... Uh, misadventures, and uh, one of them, he, he, he was, and I will stick to this just for a minute, one of them that uh, the, the, the wife of, of Putifar actually wanted to seduce Joseph, and, uh, and in the end, she did not succeed, but this was the occasion of a very, very nice uh, uh, stained glass window uh, at Notre Dame. This one is also interesting. So this is, a, this is a stained glass window of the north uh, rose window, so on the north transept. And this is uh, uh, the King Cloas, so one of the kings of Judah. And this King Cloas, he, he has a characteristic, which is that he's the one having rebuilt the temple of Jerusalem. And I'm very happy because he did it by uh, raising funds. And so I think he's the same patron of the fundraisers. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an example of uh, what we did uh, in the tribunes uh, in, of the choir of the cathedral, completely uh, cleaned up, as you can see here. Uh, so we, we used um, <coughs> to, to restore and to, to clean and to restore the walls and the pillars we used what we call a, a latex technique, which means that we, we sprayed uh, a latex on the, on the walls or on the pillars. And after uh, one or two days, you, you can remove the latex. And this, uh, this absorbs uh, the dirt on, on the walls without touching the, the stone itself. So this is the technique we use. And you can see that the result is uh, really wonderful with this uh, new, fin, this not new pillar, but this pillar completely cleaned up and restored using this uh, latex technique. Another example of one of the capitals of the pillars. We had also to, uh, to clean up and to restore the chapels and, the, and the, uh, the paintings of the chapels. So the chapels of the choir, actually, they had been uh, redone by Viollet-le-Duc. But we were able to, to, to find, again, the, the colors of these chapels. And so all these chapels are in the course of being restored. And you will see afterwards, I think, an example of this is the St. Ferdinand Chapel after restoration. And you see that the colors are completely uh, bright and completely new. If, if you happen to have visited Notre Dame in the past, so you will have a completely different uh, cathedral when you will uh, enter it next. Another example of a restoration, this is the, the basing of the feet of Christ by uh, Madeleine, Saint Madeleine. This is one of the maze, so uh, I think you had some examples given. So this is, 
Uh, actually, out of the, the 75 maids, so we know about 52 of them. 13 of them were uh, inside Notre Dame, so it's one of the 13. And the other 40, they are a little bit everywhere in, in churches, cathedrals in France, some of them in the UK. And, uh, and what we will do, some of them are actually in the, uh, in the reserves of um, uh, Musée du Louvre or, or, the, or Musée d'Arras, and so we will put them after restoration in the new Museum of Notre Dame, which will be open most probably um, in Hôtel Dieu. So this is the, uh, the Pieta, which was commissioned by uh, Louis XIV at the beginning of the 18th century. Uh, Pieta by Coustou, which is also under restoration because they were touched by, they were touched also by the, not only, not only by the fire, but also by the lead, uh, because you know that we had uh, lead uh, falling down inside the cathedral, so we have to remove also the lead damages. So this is the a very interesting part of the cathedral, which is the screen, the screen of the, of the choir, which dates back to the uh, 14th century, and uh, where you have on the, on the south side, which is this one, so I, I get back to it, on the south side of this choir screen, you have scenes of the life of Christ uh, before uh, crucifixion. So this is an example with the, the kings uh, coming to uh, uh, donate their gifts to Christ. And on the uh, north side, uh, so you have the life of Christ after uh, crucifixion. So this is wonderful. This is both in wood and in, uh, in stone, and it has been a little bit damaged but it needed any restoration, and so this is what will be done in the course of the overall restoration. On the Grand Organ, so just a view of the Grand Organ uh, after the fire. So the Grand Organ was not uh, touched as such, except from the, the watering of the firefighters. And perhaps you know that in the Grand Organs or Grand Organs, you have some laser joints uh, between the pipes, and so the laser joints, uh, they do not support very well water, so which means that we will have to uh, replace all these uh, joints. Uh, so this is after the fire. So the grand organ has been, so the pipes have been mostly removed, restored, and now we are in the process of reinstalling the pipes of the grand organ, and uh, most importantly, of reharmonizing the pipes, because this is a very long process, and it will take about six months to fully reharmonize the pipes of the Grand Organ with the target to have a Grand Organ playing for the reopening of the cathedral in December of this year. Another, another uh, I would say, key thing was to uh, restore the vaults and especially the, uh, the keystones of the vault. So this is one example of a keystone of uh, the transept before restoration. And this is how it looks like now. So you see it's completely bright, colored, and, and, and we, we are able effectively to, uh, to find again the, the colors of, of Notre Dame. So this is uh, the stand of, uh, status of the cathedral uh, right now. And so this is uh, something, uh, which it's a photo which was taken a few months ago when we started the building of the, the new spire, the new framework of the spire. So this is what we call the stool of the spire. So this is the basis of the spire, the, the wooden basis of the spire relying on the, the pillars at transept crossing. And so we will, uh, so this has been uh, erected in the past uh, six months. Uh, and, uh, so, and this, uh, we used about the equivalent of uh, 1,000 uh, oak trees because we redo exactly the, uh, the spire and the framework of the roof. The roof it was before the fire. So we had what we call the forest, uh, which was the structure of the roof of the cathedral, which was made of about 2,000 oak trees. And we will redo exactly the same because we have the the advantage of having a complete, uh, let's say, uh, 
a report on the structure of, of the roof, uh, which was done by one of the three architects of historical monuments in charge of the restoration uh, a few years ago. So we, we redo exactly the same uh, structure and the same roof and the same spire as the one we had before. So we had also evidently stone cutters working to uh, repair the, uh, the damaged uh, stones a uh, little bit everywhere uh, in, under the roof of the cathedral or uh, on the gables. And so this is how it looks like now. So this is uh, after restoration. So you see that it's very bright. There's still some scaffolding uh, inside the cathedral, but completely uh, new and completely uh, bright and fair and completely different from what it was before. Uh, you see here also uh, a view of the nave uh, with also the uh, stained glass windows which were installed by uh, Malraux in the 60s, uh, also restored now uh, on top of this picture. The pillars, as they will appear, huh, or as they appear right now after restoration, so completely new. The color of, of the vaults, the sexpartite vaults, the quadripartite vaults, the rose window here. Another view of the, the rose window. Now you know that the, the rose windows, which, what's also interesting to know is that the, the, in the Middle Ages, when they, when they built the, the stained glass windows, they used different colors depending on the orientation of the rose window. For instance, they had observed that on the north side, it was better, on the north side where there is less light than on the south side, it's better to use blues. And on the south side, where you have effect effectively the sun coming in and, and so on, it was better to use red and yellow. And this is what, what exists uh, in Notre Dame. So you have on the, on the north side more blues on the north rose window and more red and, uh, and yellow on the south rose window. And we visited, by the way, we, we visited with Cecile um, St. James Cathedral in Orlando yesterday. And I was very happy because on the south side we had also red and yellow, more red and yellow. So uh, this is apparently it's still true today uh, that we find this. Here it's the workshop uh, which was installed uh, on, the, on the square in front of the cathedral to uh, redo the, the sculptures and the, the sculpted stones which were too damaged or to repair the ones which were damaged and then will be reinstalled on the cathedral. This is an example of the uh, chimeras or grotesques, so, uh, or statues of the cathedral, so the same. So when we, when we are able to uh, restore them, we restore them, we complement them potentially, or we redo uh, new uh, chimeras or new gargoyles, uh, depending on, the, on their state. So this is one of the most famous of the 54 gargoyles, uh, not gargoyles, but grotesques or chimeras of the cathedral, which is the, the alchemist. And this is a very famous one, as well as the strige or some, some other very famous chimeras of the cathedral. To rebuild the roof, we, um, we rebuild the, the trusses uh, of the roof as they were uh, before the fire. And we did it, first of all, uh, at the workshops where these trusses were built. They are all in, uh, in oak, oak, oak tree, and, uh, and they are progressively reinstalled. So now, uh, most of them are now on the roof of Notre Dame. So you see here, an act and, and this is, <coughs> this is a, a photo which was taken a, a, few, a few days ago. And we begin to, um, to work on the covering of the, uh, this uh, timber framework, and this is why you have a new scaffolding <laughs> on top of the, of the roof of the cathedral. This is a view which was taken from the, the top of the spire, the new spire. Uh, so this is uh, from uh, 96 meters high, and this is the, uh, the, the trusses of the choir of the cathedral, which you can see here. Uh, completed now on the choir of the cathedral. 
And this is the new, uh, the new rooster of the cathedral. So perhaps you heard that the rooster of the cathedral was found after the fire, I would say more or less on the street uh, below the cathedral in a very bad state. So we, we decided not to uh, restore the, the, the rooster, but to have a new one. So this one was designed by the architect in chief, Philippe Villeneuve. But, but we were able to, uh, to find the, uh, the relics which were uh, in the rooster. So you had uh, relics uh, from Saint Denis, the first bishop of Paris. We had relics from uh, Saint Geneviève, the, uh, the, the pat patron of Paris. And we had a piece of the crown of thorns of Christ. And so these relics, they were put in the new rooster and, and blessed by the, the Archbishop of Paris. And, uh, and now they are on top of the, the spire, so Paris is safe. <laughs> <laughs> so another choice which was done, so you have seen that all the seats and the altar, which was in the middle of the cathedral, were destroyed. Even the, the choir organ, which was in the choir a little bit further, was destroyed. So there was a selection of new uh, liturgical furniture for the cathedral, which was made by, uh, by the Archbishop of Paris. And this is the new altar, which uh, this is a view. Huh? This is not in place right now, but this is a view of how it will look like, sorry, uh, with a new altar, a new cathedral for the Archbishop, a new Embon on the right hand side for the, uh, the readings. There will be al also a new baptismal font at the entrance of the cathedral, a new tabernacle, which will be uh, on, the, on the altar at the bottom of the choir. And we will have also a new reliquary of the crown of thorns, which so I can tell you, the, but I don't know if I have time to tell you the story of the crown of thorns, which is very interesting. But the crown of thorns will be uh, in a new reliquary at the bottom of the cathedral. So this is how uh, Notre Dame looks like today. And, uh, and the plan uh, is uh, to complete the uh, rebuilding of uh, the spire first, with the, the covering of the spire, with lead plaques and so on, the complete rebuilding of the roof of the cathedral, uh, which is well on the way and a complete uh, restoration and cleaning of the interior of the cathedral as the, before the end of uh, 2024. And the date which has been set for this, for this uh, momentous reopening is uh, the 8th of December 2024, uh, because it's the feast of the Immaculate Conception. So this is a very important uh, religious feast, uh, religious date, sorry. And so, uh, and so before, before going to this, uh, so, so this is the plan. And so just for, for you to know that this will not be the, this will be evidently a key milestone because uh, people will be able to re-enter the cathedral from the beginning of 2025. Uh, the religious services will also, will also resume from the uh, beginning of 2025. But this will not be the end of the restoration because we will still need to restore all the external part of the cathedral, and especially the flying buttresses, where perhaps you see that you have these big wooden brackets which are under the 28 large uh, flying buttresses. And the walls of the cathedral as well, below the level of the roof, will need also to be restored, as well as the sacristy, the, batister the baptistery, uh, uh, the presbytery, sorry, I, I mixed things. So we believe that actually we will need another four to five years after the reopening to complete the full restoration of the cathedral. At this point in time, I want to, uh, first of all, to thank you very much because I know that many of you have already supported the restoration of the cathedral and, uh, and especially uh, American donors have been very generous for this restoration. And I've, I've just given the example of one of our supporters who is Cardinal Dolan in St. Patrick's, who is one of our strong sponsors and with whom I have very friendly. So, uh, so now I know that 
When I speak to American audience, if I do not speak dollars, I am lost. So uh, just an idea of the total budget of the restoration of the cathedral. So now the estimate is that it will be up to 1 billion, 50 million euros. Uh, fortunately, we had pledges from four very large donors that you see here, Arnaud, Betancourt, Pinot, total at a level of 600 million. So which means that, and we received uh, funds uh, or pledges at a level of 250 million euros, including uh, up to now 43 million dollars from the Friends of Notre Dame de Paris, or mostly from American uh, Friends of Notre Dame de Paris. So you see, which is more or less one-fifth of the 250 million. And our uh, estimate for the full completion of the restoration is that we will need, consequently, another 200 million from 2024 to 2030, which is the 2029 or 2030, depending on uh, the funding that we will receive, uh, that we will need to complete the full restoration of the cathedral. So Friends of Notre Dame de Paris, which is a foundation that I manage, uh, is in charge of collecting the funds at international level. Uh, it's a 501c3. And uh, if you want to support us again and, and more, so you will find our brochure and pledge cards and so on at the entrance of the room. But uh, once more, thank you very much because uh, I know that you've done already a lot and, and I count on you to do a little bit more to help us <laughs> complete the full restoration. So thank you very much. Uh,